I'm going to hurry a little bit. Um, so I'm Frank James. I'm, I'm more than happy to be here. Um, this is, I think, the 17th talk I've given in BC in the past two months. Um, and you may ask why. Uh, the reason I leave my wife and son at home and come and spend time up here in BC is because it matters. What's happening to you, they want to do to our community too. And what I can tell you is that that's something that when you really understand it, it's not okay. It's really not okay. The, so the reason I do that is to come and share what it took two, us two years to learn, a group of very smart, highly motivated physicians. And you're being given 30 days to respond. In fact, you, you've got about 21 left. You have three weeks. And you need to get motivated. You need to get involved. You need to make comments. Uh, we need to raise money to get the best lawyers. We need to get the best technical experts to review this. Short of that, this is going to happen. That's what it's going to take. Um, the BC Nurses Union was asked and in two days turned around this comment. And they, they nailed it. They said, uh, we're extremely concerned about the latest EIA reports. And it fails to adequately address human health impacts associated with the project, which they definitely do not. The health officers uh, for this region were involved and got it to look at a copy. They gave several uh, specific feedbacks. Uh, and the response to that was, thank you, we don't, want, we don't want any more information from you. That's literally how blunt the letter was from the port. Now, the port is supposed to be the regulator. The proponent is Fraser Surrey Docks. The port's supposed to regulate. They are, in fact, not regulating at all. Uh, the BC Nurses Union went on to say, it's also alarming that the, um, that the assessment focused primarily on thermal rather than on full, rather on the terminal rather than the full geographic area. So they, they aren't even considering what's all these trains going through White Rock and the potential implications there. I'll talk more about that in a minute. They didn't concern, aren't concerned at all about Texade Island where, where the protections in, at, in Surrey are really much more substantial. There are virtually no protections in Texade Island. They're just gonna pile the stuff up and let it blow around in the wind, spray a little water on it once in a while to hopefully prevent that. It's that blatant. Um, now you're along the way, there's gonna be coal going uh, literally every day along, along the, the land here. And there's absolutely no consideration of that in their assessment either. So if, if anybody thinks that's an adequate environmental assessment, uh, they, they need to get a job at the port. <laughs> the, uh, as you can see, they focus almost all of their work on the Fraser Surrey docks itself. They don't want to look outside of really the perimeter of the, of the land that's there. But I want to share with you, this isn't just about us and our community. It's not about me and my community. The reason I came here is because this starts in Montana and Wyoming. And it isn't just the 8 million tons that's going, coming here. There's about, because U.S. Uh, electrical generation is moving away from coal, there's about 120 million tons of coal they're not selling in the U.S. And what they have discovered is they can sell it in China, India, and Korea. And if they do that, they can make a lot of money. This coal comes from the U.S. It's owned by the U.S. government. They sell it uh, to, to these people for about $11 a ton. Now, any of you that may have been farmers know that $11 a ton, good topsoil costs a lot more than that. So it's an extremely low-value product. And they're shipping it literally halfway around the world. And they plan on making money doing it. Well, the only way they can make money doing that is cutting corners everywhere. Um, so not only is it going to expose coal dust to all the communities along the way, in Montana, in Wyoming, in Idaho, in Washington, and in BC, it's also then going to be shipped across the ocean all the way to China and India and, and uh, Korea. Now, what, another reason I'm here talking to you today is that my wife sitting in the front row here is obviously Chinese. Um, in the past few months, she's returned to, to her home. And the reason she returned is there are three elders there that she and, and I love very much. Her aunt had stomach cancer and had to have her stomach removed. Her uncle had laryngeal cancer and had to have a trach put in so he could breathe and a feeding tube in it put in so he could, he could consume nutrients. And my favorite uncle uh, of hers uh, had a stroke and died. Now, what's going on in China is uh, is really horrible beyond our imagination. A square meter a, a, is one thing. And I take a cubic meter of air, and typically we have about 20 particles in that of, of, of pollutants, 20 particles. 
In the US and Canada, if that level gets to 100, people with pulmonary disease or kids with asthma are supposed to go inside and lay down. Typically in China and the coastal cities, the, the bottom tier, the bottom number is about 300 particles in that, in that cubic meter. And the last few years in the large urban cities, those levels have gotten up to seven to 900, occasionally even 1,000. Now honestly, that's incompatible with life, period. There was an article recently published about a girl eight years old in China with lung cancer. Every year, our life, our life expectancy grows as, as, as a world population. Things, things aren't always rosy, but every year, our life expectancy grows. The only exception is when there's a war. Now, that changed this, this past 10-year cycle. They just analyzed the data for coastal China, and they lost five and a half years of life expectancy on average. That's never happened before in the past 100 years since we've been engaged in that exercise. So this is about us and about our interests. Yeah, we're NIMBYs. This train goes within about three quarters of a mile of my home. But it's about the people in Montana that are mining it and ruining the ranches and farms there. It's about the, the wetlands all along the way that are having coal, dumped, coal dust dumped into them. It's about your community and my community. But it's also about people that, that are getting a much shorter end of the stick than we are. People for whom this is really killing in a very direct, immediate, and, and uh, dare, si dare, dare I say, genocidal way. Um, so it's, it's not just about us. And I think we need to be mindful of that. And the effort we put into this has to be in it for our best interests. But our best interests serve a lot of other people very well. Um, 120 million tons of additional capacity. Now, I can even tell you where it's going. Here's the, here's the chart. Um, so uh, 120 million tons, you can see it there. Um, some out through Washington and Oregon, and then four places here in BC where they're either building the new port, as in Fraser Shore Docks, or expanding existing ports in three other places. They want to only look at what's inside the fence at Fraser Shore Docks. They do not want to look at the cumulative effects. But the cumulative effects are the only thing you can look at if you expect to realistically understand the impacts. So one thing I hope some Canadian citizen speaks out about clearly and articulately is that cumulative impacts have to be addressed, not just for Fraser Street Docks, but for Neptune, uh, for, for Port Metro, uh, for the Prince Rupert, uh, for Port Alberni. All of those together are very different than just one by themselves, both in terms of what it does abroad, but also what it does here. Um, now, when we first started this, the group of physicians and I, there were about a dozen of us, and one young woman physician whom all of us respect. The reason we respect her is that she's in, she has both an MD degree from Harvard and a PhD uh, in epidemiology from the University of Washington. She's very smart, and she's an infectious disease expert, and if any of our children were sick, if my son was ill and in the hospital and might die, she's the person I would want to take care of him. So when she asked us, this is important, do you want to take a look at it with me? We all said yes. You know, that dozen, about a half those people had PhDs in addition to having MD degrees. And so we did what academics do. We went straight to the library. <laughs> and we asked B, the librarian, to, to find us all the articles on the storage and transportation of coal. And she came up with about 400 articles. And we worked through those one at a time. Now, we're very busy people, and we did, actually didn't have time to, um, to do a lot of this during the day, so almost everything we did between, we did between nine in, at night and about two in the morning. <laughs> and then we'd review the article, and then we'd share it with each other, and we'd critically assess them. Now, one of the guys said, you know, he, he said, this guy, he was, he's actually a pretty smart guy. He was an ER doc and then became a dermatologist. Uh, and he said, noise is really a big deal, Frank. He came to me just excited about it, and I said, Dr. Dank, you're nuts. You know, if we start talking about noise, nobody is going to believe us. You know, that's just doesn't have any credibility. But the standard we had in our work was, what does the science say? We only looked at articles published in refereed journals. That means that people had critically evaluated them before they were ever published. This isn't stuff out of the New York Times. Um, this is stuff out of the New, New England Journal of Medicine, which is arguably the most prestigious journal in, in the world. And it, these are articles that have been critically evaluated before they were ever published. 
So only journals that were uh, publishing refereed articles, that is, they'd been critically assessed before published. And as we went through these, uh, these 400 articles, we expected them to kind of be evenly distributed between things that said it was okay and things that it wasn't. And, and what we found was all 400 went into something to be concerned about. Um, and so we looked at article after article after article after article, and these are summaries of each of those. We wrote an abstract of every one, and anybody, I would love for somebody from the industry to take us on, because we, not all, we do believe in transparency. We put every one of these references and our summary up on a website and invite anybody to look at it. And I, I honestly wish they would convince me that we're wrong, um, because then I could quit doing this stuff. <laughs> um, but we, no one's done that yet. So unlike the port and hiding everything, we put it all up on a website, coltrainfacts.org, and anybody can go look at it, and I would encourage them to do that and to prove that what our conclusions are erroneous. Um, we, um, we then piled them up into piles and said, here's the general areas. Well, the general areas are that the coal dust is a problem, the diesel uh, exhaust from the, the locomotives is a problem. They're about six locomotives are required to pull every one of these trains, and the trains are about two kilometers long. We live near enough the tracks we can hear trains, and we, we used to find them very charming when they go back and forth. Um, but the coal trains, you can hear f for two or three miles away because they're so heavy and so noisy, and, and the metal on metal wheel on the rail squeals and screeches so much that you, uh, you hear it a long ways off. Um, six locomotives required to pull them, they're so heavy. Um, so that creates diesel exhaust in a way that other, other train traffic doesn't. The noise issue turned out to be a very substantial one, and I'll go over that in detail. We also found there would be delays in the crossings. Um, uh, that is, that fire and police and ambulances will not be able to cross the tracks like they used to for us. Um, that there were also safety issues about both trains and ships. Uh, the trains, if they lock up all the brakes, something they, 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 they got to stop, but it takes a mile for them to stop. That's how far it is before, if they lock up all the brakes, a mile. So if there's somebody on the tracks, uh, as happened in our community a few years ago and has happened in White Rock just a few, few months ago, there was a woman there who had some earbuds in. I'm sure they locked up all the, all the tire, all the wheels, and she was run over and killed. Same exact thing that happened in our community. We'll see more of that. Uh, ships, the same thing. And ships are something you really should be concerned about and not pe people don't say enough about. These ships that they plan on bringing in here, the reason they're not loading them up is they can't get up the Fraser, so they're taking the tax data. These are the largest things that human beings have ever made that move. That's how big they are. And they have uh, a single hull. And coal is pretty inert compared to the hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel that they're required to carry to get across the ocean. Now, you already know, if you've been reading the press at all, that BC is not prepared to respond to a major oil spill in the Salish Sea. Um, and these, these vessels have the worst safety record of any vessel. Single hold, hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel. So, the primary organ systems we've seen that, that were infected are basically respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurologic systems. Um, there were two other things we found that were really important. One is that, is that where you live matters, and, and how close you are to the tracks matters. And the thing that they do not want to talk about is that, that risk is not evenly spread in the population. What, what is very clear from scientific literature is if you live uh, where the wind blows this stuff towards you, whether it's the diesel particulate or the coal ash, I mean coal, coal dust, it's a big deal which side of the tracks you live on given the prevailing wind. One group is not going to be exposed very much at all. The other group is going to be heavily exposed. It also matters how close you are. The, the recent study in, down in Delta showed that if you're five kilometers or so away, there's not much exposure. And that ended up in the press because the, these guys are really good at it as there's no problem. If you look at the one sample that was done near the tracks, it was 30 times the allowable level of coal dust in, in the air, 30 times higher. And they didn't test anything in between. <laughs> but it's a gradient, high exposure close to it, much less further away. What the proponents want to do with, in our community is they wanted to 
average the whole county, trying to take the pollution by the track. Now, if you know anything about Whatcom County, it goes halfway across Washington State, and two-thirds of it is, is wilderness area. They would love to average it over the whole county. You get a really different number. But so it is, risk is not evenly spread in the community, and that's got to be something taken into account in the analysis of this. Um, the other thing is that risk is not also evenly spread in the community. And what we found over and over again in the medical literature is that children are at higher risk, elders are at higher risk, people with existing lung and heart conditions are at higher risk, uh, those people that have diabetes are at higher risk, and, and workers are probably the most exposed of anybody. It's really problematic for me to see them get all their employees you know, supporting this because they're at, at higher risk than any of us. But because of where they get their paycheck, they, their views are modified. Um, children in particular, you may say, well, why kids? Kids, they eat more, they, eat, they breathe more, they drink more per body weight than adults do. So they're more highly exposed to all these things we're talking about. Um, coal dust, in terms of now talking about specific exposures, is known to cause chronic bronchitis, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, and it's filled with contaminants of different heavy metals. Um, the uh, diesel particulate matter, the stuff that comes out of the locomotives and the ships and the, bar the ships that move the barges, um, increased all-cause mortalities associated with an increased number of that, impaired pulmonary development in adolescence, measurable pulmonary inflammation, increased severity and frequency of asthma attacks, ER visits and hospital admissions for kids, increased rates of heart attacks in adults, and increased rates of cancer. Um, diesel particulates do deserve just a minute of focus. They are 2.5 microns in size. There's a carbon core. And once that diesel is burnt, then things stick to that, the organic compounds, the sulfates and nitrates, the metals and the toxins. But because it's 2.5 microns in size, it's breathed into your lung and goes down all the way to your capillaries. So it goes to the alveoli and then crosses the alveolar wall into your capillaries. So you're, you're basically mainlining those things. If I want to get a, a medicine into a patient, it's more effective to give them a puffer than it is to shoot at IV because the, the surface area of your lungs is the same as a doubles tennis court. So you get higher levels quicker by breathing it in than you would by administering it intravenously. And unfortunately, that's great with drugs that you need, not so great if they're toxins. Noise exposure has been shown to cause cardiovascular disease, including increased blood pressure and arrhythmias, particularly in elders. Strokes and ischemic heart disease go up. Cognitive impairment in children for those that live near the tracks. An increased rate of accidents and injuries for people that, that are working people that are woken up at night and exacerbation of a variety of mental health conditions. You can see that um, the one place you wouldn't want to put this is near a school and every one of those gray buildings is a school. Frequent long trains are, are a big deal for some people, mostly down just after it crosses the border. We work desperately hard to shave 45 seconds off a response time. If we can shave 45 seconds off, we prevent strokes from having an impact and we, we fix heart attacks. They're talking about eight to 10 minute minimum, minimum delay in response. That's not just the ambulance, that's the police, that's the fire. Eight to 10 minutes is a long time if your, fire, if your house is burning or if there's somebody with a gun. <laughs> um, what we believe is necessary is a health impact assessment. That is an objective, independent, fair, fair to them, fair to the public evaluation to take this information we've generated and to apply it to the specific population that's gonna be exposed and to generate the numbers about how many people could be injured or suffered or killed from this. They will do anything not to do that. They've done their, I, I, I know what's happened in my community, they've done their, uh, uh, focus groups in the community, and they know that if it is jobs versus uh, the environment, jobs will always win. If the discussion, though, is the health of my wife, my child, my grandchild, my parents, their health and their life versus any amount of money that's profit for them, then the community would win and they would not. So one of the things I believe we have to ask for is an, is an objective and fair and impartial application of the information we've found to the populations that will be exposed. And I think it's imperative that they do that. Thank you very much.